Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I am the Planetarium Director, and with me tonight is one of our students who I will let say hello. Hi, I'm Len. I'm a physics and astronomy student here at UMD, and I work at the Planetarium. So tonight, uh, as part of our Spooktober series, we're going to be taking a look at monsters in the sky, which are things in the universe that either resemble or act like kind of classic Halloween type monsters and things that we, we see this time of year. Um, now, as always, throughout the show, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Uh, Lynn's going to keep an eye on that and let me know if questions come up. We'll also have time at the end for questions as well. All right, so with that, let me got to pin myself there real quick. And then... There we go. Okay. So as I said, we are talking about monsters in the sky today, and we're going to start off with some things uh, near and dear to us within our own solar system. And the very first thing we're going to look at is our sun. So this picture of the sun was taken back on October 8th in 2014 by the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And it's a really cool picture, uh, which shows the sun looking very similar to our classic jack-o'-lantern. Now, if the sun looks different than you normally see it, that's because this image was taken in UV light or ultraviolet light, which is not something our eyes can see, but is what's responsible for things like sunburns, suntan, skin cancer, that sort of thing. Um, and so the Solar Dynamics Observatory actually takes a look at the sun in many different types of light. Some of those are the types of light that we see with our own eyes, but some of those are the other types of light that the sun gives off that our eyes can't see. So that's everything down from uh, infrared, radio, up to UV and X-ray. And you can see looking at all of these different pictures of the same sun, in all of these different types of light, they give us different pieces of information. You can see different bits and different features in the different types of light. So what that UV picture, our wonderful jack-o'-lantern there, um, UV light tends to show us things that are very hot. And you can see more of that down here in this kind of these rows. You can see that these are Related, related to very, very hot temperatures. Um, and in particular, these are what we call active regions on the sun. These are areas where there's actually holes in the outer atmosphere of the sun, which we call the corona. And this is where streams of charged particles are flowing out away from the sun. Uh, the sun actually has a steady stream of charged particles that flows out through these coronal holes out into space. And we call this the solar wind. In fact, our solar wind is what's responsible for causing the beautiful auroras, uh, the either aurora borealis, which is around the North Pole, or the aurora australis around the South Pole. It's actually that stream of charged particles from the solar wind, uh, when some of it gets through and hits our atmosphere, it causes our atmosphere to glow, creating that beautiful aurora. So that jack-o'-lantern sun, those just some active regions that just happen to line up to make the sun look very similar to our classic jack-o'-lantern shape. All right, now I can't talk about monsters in the sky with not, with not at least somewhat talking about our little green men or our Martians. So our fascination with Mars, and in particular with there being intelligent life on Mars, actually got its start back in the late 1800s, around 1877, when an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli looked at Mars through a telescope and saw these kind of dark markings across the surface. And he actually made a map 
of these features that he saw. And all of these dark markings, which were like kind of these lines crisscrossing the surface of Mars, he ended up calling them canali, which is Italian for channels. Now, later, um, a few decades later, um, in 1894, or around the 1890s, we'll say, um, Giovanni Schiaparelli's work was translated from Italian into English. Well, this word canali was mistranslated. Instead of being called channels, which is what it actually means, it was translated to canals. And that may not seem important, but it does have an important distinction because channels are uh, natural features that are just caused by flowing water. Canals, on the other hand, are a man-made feature. So by calling these things canals, you were inherently implying that there had to be an intelligent race there on Mars creating those canals. Um, now, 1894 um, is around the year that Percival Lowell really kind of got in the swing of things. Uh, he is the guy who is largely responsible for making this knowledge of Martians mainstream knowledge. Uh, he built an entire observatory, the Lowell Observatory, dedicated to studying Mars and making maps of the surface. He went on public lecture circuits, wrote books, um, and he is really the reason everyone knew Everyone, not just, you know, astronomers, but general public knew that there was absolutely life on Mars. And of course, once it became public knowledge, it made its way into um, other aspects. Uh, so we have Edgar Rice Burroughs here, who wrote a series of novels about um, John Carter. John Carter? Yeah. Um, who's uh, an Earthman on Mars, um, and he's actually responsible for being the first to describe these Martians as little green men. Uh, his his description is kind of the uh, the founding of our little green men. Um, and so all of this kind of came to a head in 1965 when we sent Mariner Four to do our first ever flyby of Mars with a spacecraft and take those close-up images, which were going to show us up close what this canal system looked like and what sort of civilization the Martians had made on Mars. However, the images that we got back from Mariner 4 showed nothing of the sort. No canals, no Martians, nothing but a dry, barren landscape. And it turns out those canals that uh, Percival Lowell was so convinced were there were actually just an optical illusion. Our brains are so good at turning random pieces of information, random pieces of information into some sort of a coherent pattern. And because optics and telescopes at that time weren't super sophisticated, um, so you didn't have a really great view of Mars to begin with, and it does have, you can see here, these like dark patches on the surface, their brains just connected those into these linear features, which made them think there were these channels or canals. Um, so it was all an optical illusion, and there are no Martians on Mars and no great waterway system crisscrossing the surface. Well, we come to accept all this. I'm still fascinated by Mars for lots and lots of reasons. In fact, we've done an entire show about Mars, so you can always go check that out. Um, so much cool stuff there. Um, but then in 1976, Viking 1 sent back this image which many were very quick to point out, has a lovely face right there. And so this sparked the question again, are there actually aliens on Mars? Well, the answer is still no. Um, once we got more images of this 
portion of Mars' surface, we realized that that image of the, the face on Mars really was just a play of light and shadows um, for this kind of land formation that sits there. Um, but that is kind of a little bit into the history of Martians, why we originally thought that they were there, and a few little kind of tricky things that we have seen uh, that made us kind of wonder what could be there. Okay. So um, the next thing we're going to take a look at uh, was actually discovered on Halloween back in 2015. And it is the asteroid 2015 TB145, more commonly known as the Skull Asteroid which you can very clearly see why. Um, so this is an asteroid that, as I said, was discovered on Halloween day back in 2015 when it zipped by Earth traveling a little over, th or a little under 302,000 miles from the Earth. Uh, now, of course, it has a very eerie skull-like look to it, which is a pretty common sort of uh, depiction used around Halloween time. Uh, so what we're seeing here is the dark mark in the Hall or not Halloween, oh my gosh, in the Harry Potter series, which is used by Voldemort and his Death Eaters. Um, and it looks kind of like that, you know, a giant glowing skull in the sky. Um, so the skull-like appearance to this asteroid is another uh, example of the play of kind of light and shadows. Uh, we can see in other images taken of the asteroid that it does just kind of have a very bumpy and lumpy look to it. And it just happened to be oriented in just the right way that to us, it resembled a skull. Uh, now, it is a little bit extra bumpy and lumpy. Um, which is totally technical terms we use in astronomy, by the way. Uh, and so um, instead of being an asteroid, there's actually some debate on whether this is actually a dead comet, which would be a comet that's run out of ices. So it is a lump of rock, which is also an asteroid. Um, you can see that there's kind of a very fuzzy line there between asteroid and dead comet. Um, but that's kind of maybe getting into a little bit too much nitpicky stuff. Either way, the skull asteroid discovered on Halloween, which was just so cool. Thank you, Carr, for going by and making an appearance in our live stream tonight. All right. Um, so now we're going to leave our solar system and head on out to uh, some other creatures in our sky. And the first thing we're going to go visit is IC2118, also known as the Witch Head Nebula. Now, I want to know from you guys, um, what, or, or <laughs> let me better phrase this, um, when you look at this, what part do you see as the Witch Head? Because it turns out among those of us at the planetarium um, who I've had look at this, we all see it slightly differently. So I'm going to tell you what I see and how I see this as a witch head, and you kind of tell me whether you saw the same thing. Um, so actually, see, this whole thing is the head. So here would be like the eye socket, her pointy nose, and then this would be her mouth and her pointy chin. So that's what I see. And you can even kind of see the remnants of like a hat that she's wearing up here. Um, so that's how I see the witch head in this nebula. But as I said, other people see it slightly differently. Um, so I'm curious to know. Um, let me know if you see it the same way or something different. So a nebula is simply a, a big cloud of gas and dust in space. Um, this particular nebula is located in the Orion constellation near the star of Rigel, which is right down here. It's kind of his right knee. Um, and this sits about a thousand light years away and is what we call a reflection nebula. Um, and kind of the characteristics of a reflection nebula is this beautiful kind of blue color. What's going on here is this cloud of gas and dust is surrounded by very bright, hot blue stars. 
and the blue light that the stars are giving off is bouncing off of the gas and dust in the cloud and then bounced to us. And so we see that reflected blue light uh, bouncing off the cloud, which makes it look blue. And that's why we call it a reflection nebula, because it's reflecting blue starlight. Um, and this, again, is typically blue because usually it's the blue stars that are bright enough to cause this reflection effect. Um, now, our next creature is another nebula. This one gives me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, this is the Black Widow Nebula. Um, so this is located, um, I actually don't have written down where it's located, so I will find that out in a little bit. Um, so with this nebula, this is one that you actually don't see in visible light. You can see the same area of sky right here, and you don't really see. Um, this is one that you see in infrared light. And so what we're seeing here is the glow of the warm gas in the nebula. And the structure that it has is because there is a young cluster of stars in the middle, and all of that stellar winds blowing off of the stars, just like our sun has a solar wind, all of that wind blowing off the stars is pushing the gas and dust in the nebula away, which is creating these like spindly like features, uh, which makes it kind of gives it the appearance of a spider. Uh, and so this is the Black Widow Nebula. Now this would be what we call an emission excuse me, an emission nebula, um, because it's the, the glow we're seeing is from the gas itself and not reflected starlight. And of course the gas is hot because it's surrounded, it's got a bunch of stars in the middle of it and that's heating it up. Okay, so let's move on to a star. Um, the star we're gonna take a look at is the star named Algol. Um, this is located in the constellation of Perseus, um, and it represents, it's part of the constellation that is supposed to represent the head of Medusa. In fact, specifically, the star Algol is one of Medusa's eyes. And that's actually what the word Algol means. It's um, head of the ogre, uh, and that's actually where our word ghoul comes from, is the Arabic word Algol. Um, now, what is interesting about this star is not only is it kind of a reddish color, but roughly every three days it dims for a few hours and then brightens again. So it's this kind of blinking red star that is supposed to be the blinking eye of Medusa, which is why it has the nickname the Demon Star. Um, now, as I said, it dims roughly every three days. Um, dims for a total of about 10 hours before uh, brightening up again, before it dims again about three days later. Um, now, at the time, people, of course, didn't know why the star was blinking in and out, um, and the Greeks weren't the only ones to associate it with a more demonic uh, being uh, that was pretty common in many different cultures. Um, but today, we do know what's going on. Um, and it turns out that Algol is not a single star. It's actually a binary star system. So that's two stars that are orbiting around each other. Now, this binary star system of Algol is what we call an eclipsing binary. And that just means that the stars' orbits around each other are lined up just right so that we actually see the stars pass in front of each other as they orbit around each other. And of course, as they pass in front of each other, they block some of the other star's light. And that's what causes that dimming roughly every three days. Um, so that is the cause behind the demon star Algol. All right, so we're going to look at another set of stars, another set of binary stars, actually, that are known as vampire stars. And yes, this is some real terminology here. So binary stars are actually very common. Most stars in our galaxy are not 
single stars on their own like our sun. Most stars are in a group of at least two, a binary system. Um, sometimes you could have three, four, even up to six stars all in a system. Uh, but the most common is a binary star system. Now, some of these binary stars are very close together, which we call close binaries. Um, and this can become interesting, we'll say, when you have a close binary between two stars that are very different masses. Because the mass of a star is what determines its life cycle, its life, lifetime, how long it you know, lives. So really, really massive stars live much shorter lives than lower mass stars. Now, again, if you'd like to learn more about this, we've done an entire show all about stars and the life cycle of stars, so you can go check that out. But what ends up happening when you have a close binary between a massive star and a lower mass star, that massive star is going to start to die first. And when it dies, it puffs up and gets bigger and bigger. And in the case of these close binaries, that star can puff up so big that its companion star will start pulling the gas off of it and accumulating that gas into the star itself. It literally starts eating its companion star, just like we could say a vampire. Um, now, the vampire aspect really comes into play when you have a system that has a dead star, which we call a white dwarf or a neutron star whose companion is now puffing up and the dead star is then uh, funneling gas off of its companion star because it will kind of wink back to life for a little bit before dying again. Um, and so that's a bit more kind of into where the whole vampire aspect comes in. Uh, but yeah, there we go. Okay, the very last thing I want to talk about is cannibalism actually. Um, but it's not quite as graphic as that sounds. Uh, we are going to talk about galactic cannibalism, which again, is actually the real terminology for this. So galactic cannibalism is just the super fun way of saying two galaxies are merging together. We typically use that specific term when the two galaxies that are merging together are roughly the same size. Um, now, I particularly love this image because it literally does look like one galaxy is eating the other. Um, I think this one's also commonly known as like the Pac-Man galaxy. Um, but you can get lots of different really cool shapes and things. Um, so as the galaxies kind of are pulled together, um, the gravity of each of the galaxy pulls on the other and kind of distorts it. And so you end up getting these very distorted shapes and kind of uh, spirals, or not spirals, but like arms of stars that are kind of being distorted. And it's just really cool. Um, and we see this a lot, um, especially in the much younger universe earlier on. Um, and you can see here that galactic cannibalism can have many different uh, kind of faces to it, depending on kind of where the galaxies are in the merger process. Um, and we here in the Milky Way are not immune to this. In fact, the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are on their way to merging together into one big super galaxy. Uh, now, this is going to happen in probably the next 5 billion years, so nothing we need to worry about. Um, although I do wish that I could be around when Andromeda gets, you know, a good bit closer, because, like, this kind of sight of seeing Andromeda this big in the sky, like, that's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Um, and even if we did still have people here on Earth... We really wouldn't need to worry too much about the merger because galaxies are mostly empty space. Stars aren't going to just like run into each other. Uh, so we would probably be fine. Nothing would really happen to us other than our night sky would just get a good bit brighter because we'd have a lot more stars in it. All right. Well, 
that concludes our Monsters in the Sky show. Um, it's a really fun one that I enjoyed so much putting together um, and kind of showing some of the cool, creepy creatures uh, that are out there in our universe. All right, uh, let's take a look to see if there are any questions. Which it doesn't look like. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments. Uh, I'll give it a few minutes to see if any questions do come through. Um, in the meantime, I can tell you about what's coming up over the next week. Um, so we're coming up to the end of October. Um, so the last of our Spooktober shows is going to be next Wednesday. Uh, and that is Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them in the Sky. So this is the second part of our Harry Potter show um, where we're going to take a look at the uh, fantastical creatures in the Harry Potter universe that are represented in the sky. Uh, and then next Saturday, I cannot believe it, uh, we're a week away, <laughs> is our Halloween event. Uh, we're doing a drive through event this year where you can come up and get a bag with candy and fun activities. We'll have demos out that you can watch from your car. We're going to drop pumpkins off the roof, all sorts of really fun stuff. Uh, you can find more information about it um, either on our Facebook page or on our website. I can't believe we're a week away. I really can't. But, all right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come through, so I think we will wrap it up there. Uh, thank you. I've everyone. got a quick question, actually. Yeah. Have um, astronomers come up with a name for what galaxy will be formed when our galaxy and Andromeda collide? Um, I haven't heard of an official name. Um. I think we asked this in a previous stream a couple months ago, and I want to say that it was, like, the favorite among our viewers was, like, the milkshake or something like that. I think that's perfect. <laughs> um, so I think the common ones that are thrown out are either, like, milk dromeda, which I just don't like as much as the milkshake galaxy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I don't know of an official, I don't know of an official name for it. That would be cool. All right. Well then, I think we will wrap it up there. I don't know. How about you guys, as our, our last kind of thing for the show, if you have an idea for a name for the mega galaxy that's going to form when Milky Way and Andromeda merge, let us know. I'd love to hear what you think. All right, well, we will wrap it up there. Again, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Again, look out for our show next week, our Halloween event next Saturday, and then after that, we'll get back to more of our regular programming um, with more just regular astronomy content uh, every week on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 7. All right, have a great rest of your weekend, everyone, and we will see you next time.